Chapter 5, Direct and Circumstantial Evidence. More on that. Let's first look at page 113 of your book. Myths. The bottom, myths about direct and circumstantial evidence. A conviction cannot be based on circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence is given more weight than circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence means a physical object, murder weapon, ransom note. Circumstantial evidence means hearsay and rumors about the case. Not true on any of those. Facts about direct and circumstantial evidence. This is the truth. There is no rule that mandates which type of evidence are used to convict. The jury decides how much weight will be placed on each piece of evidence. The credibility of the witnesses has a lot to do with the weight the jury assigns to the evidence. Direct evidence is based on first-hand knowledge, personal knowledge, or observation of the person testifying. Circumstantial evidence means testimony that indirectly proves a fact. The jury must use an inference to connect circumstantial evidence to the commission of the crime. Slide five, direct evidence is personal knowledge of, from observation, no need for an inference or presumption, and it's admissible if legally obtained and not privileged. We'll talk about privileged communication later. Circumstantial evidence indirectly proves a fact, also admissible if relevant. Judges determine matters of the law. The jury determines the weight of the evidence, the credibility of the witnesses, the credibility of the evidence. Page 114 defines direct and circumstantial evidence even more. Slide 6, weight of evidence. It is up to the trier of fact to decide the proper importance of any piece of evidence. If the trial has a jury, they decide on this issue. If it is a bench trial, which is only a judge and no jury, he decides or she. Often the credibility of the witness is most important. Page 115, let's look at that, just top paragraph. The jury, as trier of the facts, is given the duty to decide the effect and weight of each piece of evidence. This requires the jury to decide which testimony to believe if there's a conflict between testimonies of witnesses. Next paragraph, when direct evidence is introduced, the jury's main function is to decide the credibility of the witnesses. This usually revolves around two factors, the demeanor of the witness and the likelihood that what the witness said could have happened. Facts disclosed during impeachment, such as per personal biases or prior felony convictions, may also be considered. Um, also, you should look at the examples just below that. Examples of things that may be used to determine credibility of a witness. Read through that. Slide 7. Circumstantial evidence ability. Basic questions for a jury to include. Did the defendant have the skill and technical knowledge to commit the crime? Page 116. Circumstantial evidence of ability to commit the crime. Some crimes are committed in a manner that indicate that the suspect had special skills, skills or ability that the average person would not have had. Okay. Did the defendant have the means to commit the crime? Bottom of page 117, means to accomplish the crime. The fact that the defendant had the means to accomplish the crime can also be used as circumstantial evidence if the average person would not have access to the necessary equipment or location. And read page 117, read the examples of skills and technical knowledge needed to commit the crime. Top of page 118, read the examples of the means to accomplish a crime, to, to get more examples. Did the defendant have the physical capacity? Read the examples of physical ca capacity at the bottom of page 118. Did the defendant have the required mental capacity? Page 119 at the top. Mental capacity may also be relevant. This is obvious that the defendant is pleading not guilty by reason of insanity or diminished capacity. Specific intent crimes and crimes requiring premeditation also make mental capacity more important. You should read through the examples of mental capacity on page 119. Slide 8, circumstantial evidence 
intent, modus operandi, method of operation, or MO. It's defined as a similar pattern of behavior or plan, often past crimes mirroring present offense, used to show an act is not an accident. The bottom of page 119, modus operandi is the method of operation, or MO. Many criminals become creatures of habit and rather method methodically commit the crimes in the same way. When this happens, the prosecutor can introduce evidence of the defendant's prior crimes that were substantially similar to the current one. Motive. A rational, emotional, or practical reason for committing the crime. You should also look at page 120, examples of modus operandi at the bottom. Top of page 121, motive does not have to prove by the prosecution have to be proven, does not have to be proven by the prosecution unless it is included in the definition of the crime. And bottom of page 121, read the examples of motive to commit the crime. Threats, statements, or promise in the past to commit an act like the present crime. Page 122, the fact that, it, that the defendant has threatened to commit the crime is circumstantial evidence that he or she committed it. And it may be relevant in self-defense cases, too. Bottom of page 122, read the examples of relevant threats to commit the crime. Slide 9. Circumstantial evidence. Guilt. Behavior after the commission of a crime is typically admissible, such as the suspect tried to avoid capture or punishment. The suspect concealed evidence, like a murder arson. The suspect was in possession of stolen property or suddenly wealthy. The suspect threatened a witness of the crime. Look at examples on page 124 of concealing evidence. Fifth Amendment issues, silence before or after the crime cannot be admitted as evidence of guilt. Slide 10, Griffin versus California. The defendant, Edward Griffin, was accused of murder. At trial, he did not take the stand to testify in his own defense. The prosecution commented on his silence, inferring guilt. Griffin was sentenced to death. On the appeal of the Supreme Court, they ruled the prosecutor's comments were improper and they ordered a new trial. Look at slide 12. Character in general is defined as a person's moral traits. The reputation is defined as what people believe to be a person's character to be. And restriction on admission, usually character is only at issue if the defendant raises it as a defense. It can be limited to whether a defendant did or did not commit a specific act. Character of the victim can be critical and is admissible in cases of self-defense and other cases too. Page 127. At the top, the use of character witnesses is restricted to three basic situations. The defendant may try to use his or her good character to convince the jury that he did not commit the crime. The defendant's specific character traits may be used to infer that the defendant did or did not commit the crime. Specific character traits of the victim may be used when relevant to commit the crime. Just below that, the prosecution is not allowed to attack the defendant's character unless... The defendant placed character at an issue first. The defense called character witnesses. The defendant's character has been placed at issue. The prosecution has two avenues to refute the defense character witnesses. One, attack the credibility of the defense character and or call character witnesses themselves during rebuttal.